going to be reading today from the book of Galatians, I'm in chapter 6, verse 9, that is Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the churches in Galatia, says the following under the unction of the Holy Ghost, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap, we shall reap, if we do not lose heart, we shall reap. And from this scripture, I intend to preach to you today a message I have simply entitled, Steadfast. Let's have a word of prayer that God would bless this time of preaching and open all of our hearts and minds. Jesus, we magnify you. We thank you, Jesus, for bringing us all to this place, Lord. You knew every every single person was going to be in this sanctuary today. You knew every single set of ears that was hearing this message would hear it today, Lord. We pray, Jesus, that you would open all of our hearts, open our minds. Use me to impart this word to this congregation, Jesus. Pour your anointing upon me, Lord, and let it be done for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The Apostle Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia were written to a group of believers, a group of churches who were undergoing a lot of strife. They were in the midst of turmoil. These were churches that were near and dear to the Apostle Paul's heart. He may have founded some of them on his missionary journeys. He may have come upon these congregations when they were still small and helped to nurture them to a point of spiritual growth. But whatever the case, it's clear that Paul truly had a vested interest in these churches and loved them very dearly. And he had played a key role in ensuring that their doctrinal foundation was built upon the gospel and only the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, something terrible had happened in the time since Paul had left. False teachings, false teachers had begun to creep into the church bodies, as they so often do subtly at first and then becoming worse and worse, before finally these churches were engulfed in strife and animosity and infighting, as is always the case whenever false doctrines and false teachers are are introduced into the picture. There was a great deal of conflict in these churches at this point. This is clear from The language Paul uses in the epistle, he speaks of the church members biting one another, devouring one another, consuming one another, which is strong language even for the Apostle Paul. And if we put ourselves in the shoes of those saints who had remained steadfast and remained loyal and remained true to the gospel during this time in these churches, it's easy to understand the frustration they were probably feeling. They had done everything right. They had endeavored to keep the unity of the faith. They had endeavored to build the church up, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not only did it feel like they were losing ground, it felt like they were losing the battle. It felt like the forces of darkness were closing in upon them, that they were really losing ground. It's easy to understand their frustration. It's easy to understand their weariness. And it's all too easy for us, I feel like, to grow weary in our walk with God. It's so easy to grow weary when we focus on showing others kindness with everything we do. And so often our kindness is met with apathy or even hostility. It's easy to grow weary when we share our testimony with everyone we meet. And so often that testimony is met with either a lack of caring or mockery or scorn. It's easy to grow weary in that grind of true disciple making when we spend so much time, so much effort in discipling someone and trying to teach them the word of God only to see them walk away from their Christian walk. It's so easy to grow weary when the eternal fate of those around us, those we love the most, our family and friends, is at stake, and we just can't seem to get through to them. It's easy to grow weary when we hear talk of revival and harvest in our cities, in our state, in our nation, and that revival just doesn't seem to be coming fast enough for us. And therein lies the root of the problem most of the time, I think. I don't think it's a matter of people losing faith in God. It's a matter of things not moving as quickly as we would like them to in our humanity. Because let's face it, in our humanity, we want things done, we want them done immediately, we want them done right now, and if they don't happen right now, then something must be wrong, right? We're all familiar with that old adage of slow and steady wins the race, but for some reason, slow and steady just doesn't resonate with our humanity. We want fast, we want exciting, we want immediate results, and it's made even worse by the society that we live in today. We live in a day of instant gratification. I remember when I was a young man, trying to get onto the internet and having to wait 45, 50 minutes, even an hour to to get online at night. And now we all have smartphones in our hands and we have the internet in the palm of our fingertips, but if you open up a website and it takes more than five seconds, maybe it's just me, but I'm about ready to throw the phone across the room because something's got to be wrong. My Wi-Fi connection must have dropped out or something because surely it can't take five seconds for a website to load. But that just speaks to where we are. 
in our humanity. With, we're, we're a very impatient people. And no human is, is immune to this. Even Abraham, the father of the Israelites, one of the fathers of the faith, the patriarch of the nation of Israel, even he succumbed to it. He was promised a child, him and his wife were promised a child by God, but it didn't come fast enough for him. He grew impatient. He took matters into his own hands with disastrous results, results that we still reap the, the fruits of even today. And the devil would like nothing more than to see the saints of God worn out and grow weary. He would like nothing more than to see them ground down. First Peter chapter 5, verses 8-9 through 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. The Apostle Peter says, be sober, be vigilant. Those are two characteristics that fly in the face of weariness. The devil doesn't like sober. The devil doesn't like vigilant. He likes weary. He likes when the saints of God are worn down. And it's not a coincidence that the Apostle Peter compares the devil to a lion here. Because when a lion goes hunting, he doesn't charge headstrong into a pack of gazelles, valiantly clashing with the strongest member of the pack. No, he lurks in the shadows. He stalks his prey. He watches and waits for that perfect time when the weak, the infirm, the weary is drawn away from the pack. And only then he strikes. And that's why the Apostle Peter says we need to resist him by remaining steadfast in the faith. Steadfast in the faith. That's what we need to do. The Apostle Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, steadfast is the opposite of weary. When we remain steadfast, we stay on that path. We resist that natural urge to grow tired when things around us aren't moving as quickly as they like. We can rest on the promise that our labor is not in vain in the Lord but we shall reap in due time. And that's the key right there, in due time, when God's perfect timing comes. If we go back to that passage in Galatians, when Paul writes, for in due season, when he originally wrote that in the Greek, the word he uses is kairos. Now, the Greeks had two different words for time. Kronos was one of them. That's what we would normally think of when we hear the word time. But there was another word, kairos. And kairos doesn't just mean any, any old time. It means a very specific time. It means the perfect time. It means the appointed time. It means that time in which God's timing has been perfect. That's why Paul uses that word. Just because we don't see something happen in the time period that we expect it to or want it to does not mean it's not going to happen. It just means that due season has not come yet. That kairos has not yet come. But we got to remain steadfast, church. We got to remain steadfast. We may not always see the fruits of our labor when we decide that the time is best. You know what? We may not even see the fruits of our labor until we've been called home to be with the Lord sometimes. But if we remain steadfast, if we avoid growing weary, we can rest on the promises of God that our labor is not in vain. The farmer of a sweet cherry tree, when they plant a cherry tree from seed, it can take up to 10 years before that tree bears any fruit whatsoever. For all of those 10 years, that farmer has to prune, he has to water, he has to fertilize, he has to protect that tree from prey and from predators, day after day, month after month, year after year, with no apparent fruits to his labor at that point. Think of all the challenges that farmer faces during that time. The early frost the one year, the persistent drought the next, that unexpected hailstorm in the ninth year that threatens to wipe out all of that progress, but yet he remains steadfast. He remains steadfast because that day when that tree finally bears fruit, what a glorious day that is. It's all worth it at that point. If the farmer of a simple fruit tree can remain so steadfast, how much more important is it that we, as the saints of God, dealing with matters of an eternal nature, must remain steadfast? And one must not look any further than this pulpit right now to see an example of why we must not lose heart if things don't happen as quickly as as we hope or expect them to. Some of you know my story, some of you may not, I'll share some of it here with you today. I didn't grow up in church, I didn't grow up in a Pentecostal background or anything like that. You know, went to church a few times when I was a young man, but as I got older, as I got into my teen years, I strayed further and further away from God. Until by the time I was 20 years old, anything related to Jesus was quite literally the last thing on my mind at that point. 
Now, I had a good friend of mine whose mother invited me to church in 2006, actually this very church, it wasn't here, but this very church body, and not wanting to be rude, I said yes, I went with her. I didn't really have any interest in it, but, you know, I'm a nice guy, I don't like to be rude or anything, so I said, sure, I'll go along, and I'll be honest with you. The people were great, everybody was wonderful, the pastor and his wife were lovely, but I didn't think I got anything out of it. I mean, the second the preacher started preaching, I just flipped him off like you'd be turning a radio station when a commercial came on. I just switched him right off. She also, after that, she gave me a new King James Bible. She gave me a set of Bible study tapes, and at that point, I'd pretty much had enough. I thought I did my due diligence in, in, in not being rude, so I said, thank you, but no thank you. I'll take what you have for me, and, and I'll stick it in a box, and that's what I did. I stuck it in a box for 10 years. It saddens me that I would call that my junk box. And that really speaks to how far I was from God at that point, that this Bible and these tapes would sit in the box that I called the junk box, the box that I didn't have any other home for. I just stuck it in there. But you see, something had happened when I went to church. I hadn't realized anything had happened. I hadn't realized that I had gotten anything out of the service, but a little seed, a small seed, had penetrated my spiritual hardness. It had penetrated deep into my spirit, and it was just sitting there, waiting for that perfect time for the kairos, to finally spring forth. Now as time went on, the, the years went on, and I strayed somehow even further and further from God, unsurprisingly, my life became more and more difficult. I was dealing with things like addiction, emotional issues, mental issues, and without the Lord, I had no effective way to deal with them. You know, the funny thing about the world is they've got a thousand ways for you to deal with your problems, but none of them actually work, none of them last, none of them hit the root cause. It's like treating a gunshot wound with a Band-Aid. You might stop the bleeding for a couple minutes, but at the end of the day, that bullet's still deep inside of you, causing damage. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And not only did it fall, but great was its fall. Now needless to say, I was the foolish man at this point. My world felt like it was about to come crashing down. At this same time in my life, I joined a fantasy football league with some friends of mine. Some of them were, were some of my best friends, a couple of the other guys in the league. I was acquainted with, I knew them enough to say hello to them, but that was pretty much it. And one of those guys who I was, didn't really know too well who I was acquainted with, he went out of his way to show me kindness. Not just once or twice, but again and again, year after year for years on end. He knew I was going through things, he would always reach out, see how I was doing. And then finally in the fall of 2016, he knew that I was in a really tough place, so he called me up and said, hey, why don't you come out and visit me for a weekend? He lives in Chicago. He called me, invited me out, and the second I got off the phone with him, I booked a ticket, which right there, I mean, obviously the hand of God is on this, this story in so many ways, but in retrospect, that right there is certainly God acting because you can ask my wife, the prospect of me spontaneously buying a plane ticket to fly halfway across the country is something that most certainly probably never will happen again and never had happened until that point. But it happened then. I got off the phone, I booked the ticket. In January of 2017, I was flying out to Chicago now, my friend was active in church. I knew this. He had asked me if I wanted to go to church with him that Sunday. I said yes. And there was something different this time. There was a hunger that was there. There was a thirst that was there. I, I didn't turn the pastor off at this point. I was locked into every single word he was saying. There was a hunger. That seed that had been planted a decade earlier was finally ready to spring forth. After service, I sat with the pastor. I sat with my friend. We sat there and prayed. As the Apostle Peter said on the day of Pentecost, I was cut to the heart. I repented of my sins, and something happened. Not having any knowledge of the Bible, any knowledge of the Word of God, I began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave me utterance. As God filled me with His Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, what a wonderful day that was. Oh, thank you, Jesus. How glorious that day was when that seed finally sprung forth. I got on a plane, I flew home the next day. The day after that, I was on the phone with Pastor Frank, being baptized in Jesus' name. A week later... Praise God, and here I am. And that Bible that had sat in that box for so long, that sat in the junk box for 10 years, I'm happy to say that that Bible is no longer in the junk box. 
I read it every night before I go to bed. In fact, I preach from it today, the Word of God. It sits here right on this pulpit with me. Oh, isn't God wonderful? He is truly amazing. He is truly amazing, and His ways are so far beyond ours, church. We'll never know the plans He has in the moment. When those seeds were planted, there was no fruit readily apparent. It would have been very easy to lose heart when I was invited to church, went once and said, thank you, no thank you. But those seeds had been planted. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So often the process of bringing someone to the Lord is just that. It's a process. It's not a one-person effort. It's a team effort. We don't always know the good that we'll do and how it contributes. We don't always know if that Bible study that we taught to somebody who didn't seem to really get what we were talking about, who walked away and didn't take anything away from it. We don't know if 15, 20, 30 years later it's going to finally spring forth. We don't know if that act of kindness that we gave to that person who didn't repay us with anything, that we thought we were just banging our head against the wall. We'll never know if that act of kindness serves as the final burst of water to let that seed spring forth from the ground and finally grow. Whatever the case may be, we must remain steadfast. We cannot lose heart. We cannot grow weary in doing good. And we must remain faithful and rest on the promises of God because he said that we shall reap in due season. And it's only natural in our humanity that there will be those times when we feel that weariness begin to creep at the door. And it's at those times especially that we need to make sure that we have our house built upon the rock. Not upon the sand, but upon the rock. Psalm 18 verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust. Our rock is our risen Savior who can sympathize with all of our difficulties. He underwent more heartache, more cruelty, more difficulty, more rejection than any of us in our humanity can possibly fathom. And no matter how hard it gets for us, no matter how tired we finally grow, we can always find rest in him because he said to us, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And as I get ready to close here, I'm reminded of the words of an old hymn that we sometimes sing in church. The actual title of the song is A Heavenly Vision, although we usually refer to it by the first words of the chorus. It was inspired by a tract titled Focused, which was written by Isabella Lilius Trotter, who was a missionary to Algeria at the turn of the 20th century. As is so often the case in the mission fields, her life was fraught with peril, was fraught with difficulty, was fraught with danger. Results were slow in coming, to say the least. Yet she remained steadfast. She didn't lose heart. Every day she would travel to the hills outside the city of Algiers, look over that city and pray. Pray for revival. Pray that she would finally reap what, these, what she had been planting, what she had been working so hard for. And she remained faithful her entire life. What was her secret? How did she remain steadfast in the face of adversity, in the face of results that weren't quick in coming? If we look at the words to the hymn, we can see what her mindset was. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We can rest on the promises of God, church, and know that they will come to fruition in due season if we do not lose heart. We can live our lives confident that the word of God will not fail us. We can look full in the wonderful face of Jesus when we undergo trials, tribulations, difficulties, when we find ourselves growing weary, and those feelings of discouragement, those feelings of despair, those feelings of impatience, of frustration, will go strangely dim in the light of our Lord and Savior.